Hey folks, this is Don from BrainBlinks.com, and I'm trying something a little different today. I'm on camera, and I'm going to do kind of a walkthrough video tutorial covering my process in Mandel Bulb 3D for making one of these crazy morphing animations. It's something that I've been meaning to do for a long time, and I uh, figured I'd try it today. i got a new standing desk set up, and it feels good for doing this kind of video broadcast thing, so I'll give it a try. And we're going to make something similar to this today. Just a simple morphing animation between one interesting shape and another interesting shape. And uh, so let's get to it. I'm going to use that animation we were just looking at as a starting point. Here are the keyframes for it. Here's that main heart shape shape. And... Uh, here are the two formulas that make up that shape. It's just the amazing box, which is a really popular formula amongst the mandel knots, and uh, the rotate function. So it's kind of a rotated amazing box, a lot of people call it. And if you're starting from scratch, you can find amazing box right here under 3DA. And the second formula, the uh, rotate, would be under here, ADS. There's several flavors of rotate. This is the simplest one. And that's one reason I like to use this today because there's only one variable really on the amazing box you need to adjust for today anyway. And there's only three on the rotate. So it's easy to get a handle about uh, on what's, you know, kind of going on um, with these shapes. I was going to get rid of that color. Let's just make it a different color. D D D D D D D D D D D D D Whatever. We might fix that later. Usually I just go with the white um color when I'm looking for new shapes so the colors don't kind of distract me. Okay, so what we want to do for this animation since we're gonna just do a morph between two points, let's just find an interesting starting point. over here in our 3D navigator. I think what I'm going to do first of all is change the scale of the amazing box just so I don't want to repeat what we what I just did yesterday. And then we'll just jigger around with some of these rotate functions until we find something that might catch our eye. which isn't hard to do with this program. That's one of the problems is you're always seeing something that's just just as interesting as the last thing you saw. So a lot of the, uh, the challenge is to uh, find something that you like and then enhance it and make it more interesting without getting distracted <laughs> by another interesting thing. All right, I'm going to save this file. We're going to call this our starting point. Usually I take much longer when I'm doing these explorations, but uh, today we need to go fast so I don't bore you guys too much. That's the great thing about this, uh, any kind of fractal exploration or any kind of algorithmic art really is the, the kind of happy accident aspect of it and the kind of pure composition uh, aspects of it. There's all these crazy shapes and patterns that you have some control over but not a lot. Uh, but you do have control over the framing and the presentation and the lighting and what you choose to focus on. So it's kind of an exercise in pure composition and uh, the creative process uh, which is what I really like about it. <laughs> so I like this kind of mountainy spiral shape. I've seen something like this in my uh, golden spiral video. Let's kind of circle around it and see what it looks like. I've got that initial point saved. The alien jello mold. <laughs> That's kind of cool though. Ooh, that looks neat. Come 
calculate. One other nice thing about this combination of formulas and the settings I have, the DE stop is at 3, race step multiplier is 0.3, it's pretty high. Um, is that they render pretty quickly. <laughs> That's one of my goals with this Mandelverse Express series is to make a bunch of quick ones instead of taking weeks and months to turn out a big long involved high resolution one. Ooh, I really like those canyons and rivulets. Rivulets. Those are awesome. Yeah, let's save that. <clears throat> So heck, it might even be just as easy as that. Let's let's see what the morph between these two shapes and positions look like. I moved the camera a little bit, and I moved the morphing shape. So oh, whatever, every second frame downscaling of five. Render preview. So we're into a quick preview. Um, I learned a long time ago when I was doing this that it's always better to do a lot of preview renders. And maybe even a low resolution test render before uh, you commit to a big heavy project that's going to take weeks and weeks to render because it's, it's very easy to make a mistake and uh, end up wishing that you hadn't just wasted three weeks of rendering something. So don't be afraid to make a test render. You know, go get some coffee or uh, take a walk or uh, let it run overnight. Just uh, if it's something a little higher resolution. Get a good look at what you're going to be spending all that computer time on. It's pretty good, but I think I want more of a change as it rotates around. Let's mess with this some more. That's pretty interesting. And remember, we can do as much crazy stuff as we want right here because we have all the ones that we liked already saved in this animation palette. So as long as you're good about uh, just clicking that button to put it on your palette and then saving your file out, you don't ever have to really worry about losing something cool. <laughs> Although I've done that a hundred times. I don't <laughs> You get so into that and start tweaking around in there that you forget to save and it's inevitable. Wow, that's really cool. I think that might be our end point. Let's see what that looks like. <clears throat> so we're going to set it to linear right now just because I want to see what from this exact frame to this exact frame. Uh, one feature of Mandelbulb 3D is the uh, quadratic Bezier interpolation uh, that smooths out the keyframes. Um, but it doesn't always hit on the exact frame. If you want it to hit on that frame, you have to kind of trick it. I'll show you that when we set it up. But in this case, I didn't want it to interpolate to that third setting that I have. So that's why I did a linear from frame one to frame two. Yeah, this is looking awesome. I love the spiraling clash of patterns that this amazing box can turn up. Amazing rotated box. Oh yeah. It is awesome. I'm gonna back up and move over to the right just a little. Excuse me. All right. We're going to forget this shape for now. And I think I also, I don't know why, but I kind of want to swing around this shape first. So, dang, if I keep doing these uh, 
live video things, I'm going to have to sell advertising space up here for you guys. <laughs> or I'll just put hotkey commands up here. <laughs> All right, let's see. I don't want to change that too much. I really like that weird pattern there. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to stick that as the first frame, but to do that, you have to insert it between these two and then do this. So now that one I was just working on is the first frame. So let's go to quadratic Bezier now. Bezier, whatever you call it. GIF, 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 GIF. That's going to move this camera out and to the right a little bit. Another good thing, I don't know if I already mentioned in this take, but if you you got to have a lot of patience with Mandible 3D when you're using it, and uh, you have to have a willing to try something different. <laughs> you have to have a willing to like tweak a setting and then see what it looks like, and tweak another setting, see what it looks like, uh, especially when you're first learning. Yeah, it looks great. I like the composition of that, it's like a breaking wave or something. Pow. Okay, so um, let's just see what that looks like with just straight quadratic Bezier. One, two, three. Ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. This probably take two minutes. <clears throat> let's do a higher resolution one so we can see it better. And I'll make some more coffee. We'll pause this while it renders. <laughs> okay. Hey, I got the record button. What a concept. All right, um, so we got lucky on that. That thing is awesome. So uh, all I really want to do now is um, kind of do an ease in and ease out on these frames. And I'll show you a quick way to do that. Um, because of the, the Bezier interpolation, that it won't actually hit all of these exact keyframes, especially if the, there's a lot of action involved. So uh, what you can do is just I'm going to copy that information to the main, plop it in between these two to duplicate it. And I'm going to do that again. And then I'm just going to do like one second's worth of video between this frame and this frame. And uh, this final one is going to be 24 frames a second. So I'll do 24 there. I'm going to do about 200 frames here, 200 there. And then I'm going to ease out a little slower at 36 frames a second between this one and this one. So that will give us a very slow movement for the first, uh, most of the first second. And then it will start morphing into between frames 2 and 3 and continue to 3 and 4. And then it will do a nice a slow slowdown at the end. <clears throat> So let's do another preview since we changed some stuff here. And I'm going to render every sixth frame and downscale it pretty well because we're mostly worried about the timing at this point. We know what it all looks like because uh, we just made it. <laughs> so we'll just render this again. It's good to get a feel for the way it interprets between your keyframes. If there's a lot of movement or the camera moves a long way between shots, then it's going to overshoot your keyframe by quite a bit. If it's a slow movement, then it'll be more subtle and it might even get very close to the actual keyframe that you hit. In this case, it's such a simple set of moves that um, it's not as noticeable. 
Boy, we sure to get lucky on this one. <laughs> Some awesome patterns in there. So, because we are rendering every sixth frame and showing it every four frames per second here on this control, excuse me, the, the timing, the overall timing on this clip is actually accurate to how it will play back when we finally render it. So we can, we can get a, a good feel for the timing of this and whether or not it's going to be smooth enough. Of course, there'll be six frames for every one in this one, so I think this is just right for our purposes. I would actually like a few more frames in that section, just because it's so awesome looking. I think I will try to stick a couple more frames in there. Okay, another thing is we need to check for our animation, the output format. I'm using JPEG for this, so I usually do that unless I'm really worried about it being a crystal perfect clear picture. Uh, we are using the Bezier. We don't want it to loop because that will affect the first and last frames. And we're doing 1280 by 720 with no anti-aliasing. We're going to have an output folder. That's one thing you definitely want to set. Man, my cast lock is crazy today. <laughs> it will not shut off. All right, so there's that folder. And what I usually do right after I save the output folder is save the animation file again because that we want to have all this set in the final animation file in case we have to shut down or restart uh, our, our, our rendering. So we're good. Let's start this sucker up. So here is the folder where we're saving our output files. And you can see uh, now uh, the new feature with uh, M3D is it kind of saves a dummy file while it's working on the file. So if you have a network set up in multiple computers, you could give them all that same .m3a file, point them at that network folder, and just let them run and not worry about re-rendering the same image on the different machines. It's a really simple, good solution to uh, the problem of network rendering. <laughs> I gotta try that out. I don't know why I haven't tried that yet. I have two computers. I could get two for one. Uh, another tip, um, M3D has some really good controls over how many threads and cores it's going to use on your computer. I have six cores, so right now it's maxed out, but if I wanted to leave this rendering in the background, a lot of times I'll just pop it down to two, and uh, I can do pretty much anything I want and not even notice it. I mean, I can play video games, edit video, do whatever, and it, um, it Mandible, it's very good about, it's very well behaved and stays in the background really well. So, but let's say you needed to turn off your computer or you needed to do something else where you can't have your computer running. So all I do is hit stop. And I'm just gonna double check that I have my animation saved. I'm going to close Mandible 3D, load it back up. Oh, I hope this is running. I'm having a problem with my record buttons today. Okay, um, I'm going to load up our animation file. And this is the folder. It's got three completed images. All right, oh, yeah, dang it, now I'm going to confuse you. But anyway, our last completed frame is number five, um, so we just want to start at frame number six. And it'll pick up where it left off. So, yeah, that that's it. That's um, a rapid-fire version of my process for making these morphing animations. Uh, I hope that helped. Uh, some of you mandal knots out there are trying to figure out mandal bulb 3D. Uh, go ahead and leave your comments and questions, suggestions down below, and uh, subscribe for more. If you like this style of video, let me know, and I'll do some more of them. Uh, it uh, it's it's kind of fun doing it this way. I have some ideas of uh, other ways I could take this format too. So uh, leave your suggestions and comments, and thanks for watching. Bye. Oh.
Oh man, okay, this is the last take because I don't have any more coffee. We're going to do this.